Tonight is one that deals with reasons why, some reasons why, people will fall away. If we were to list and discuss all the reasons in which we think people fall away, uh, we probably could have a lectureship on those types of things. But tonight we want to look at just a few things and some, um, you might say, attitudes, uh, more than just listing, but just attitudes as well, that cause some to fall away. What are some reasons people fall away? Well, there's a whole list of them. There's so many that, again, we'd be here a while if we would consider all of them. But let's consider together some points about apostasy, as we sometimes call it, and falling away from the faith. We think about some reasons why people fall away. We think about our uh, key text really for this evening, 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, where Paul says, Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is, is in you? unless indeed you are disqualified. Now we know, as we see here from the text, it's pretty clear that Paul is telling us that we should examine ourselves as to whether or not we are truly in the faith. If we were to create an exam, a test, to determine whether or not we are in the faith, we think about maybe things like some signs of faithfulness, uh, signs of obedience to the gospel, things such as that. How many of those could we answer in such a way that would reveal that we are indeed in the faith? Paul says here to test yourselves. This doesn't mean that we test ourselves with temptation, but it means that we look at our lives and we look at what the Bible says and we see if indeed we are, according to the Bible, in the faith. He says in verse 5 also, Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you are disqualified? Now when we say that Christ is in us, we mean in a figurative sense. We know the Holy Spirit dwells within us through the Word of God. But we also know, as he, point, as he points out here, he, as he says, unless indeed you are disqualified. Think about it this way, unless in fact you're not faithful. If we're not faithful, if we're not actually qualified, we're not a Christian, then Christ indeed will not dwell within us. So let's look at some points about why some people fall away. A first thing to consider is some simply get distracted. And we know we're not talking about when the phone rings and you're driving down the road and your text message goes off or someone calls you in the middle of a football game. We're not talking about that kind of distracted. We mean that people get distracted, and because of things going on, maybe they become, we might say, too busy for their own good. Uh, we know the Bible warns, and many have said that the idle hands are the devil's workshop, and so if we sit around doing nothing, many times we're doing something we shouldn't. But if we want to stay busy, we want to also stay busy in a way that's pleasing to God. But we can get distracted by jobs, we can get distracted by family, we can get distracted by friends, by the world in general, and we can, because of that, because of those types of things, allow disobedience to creep into our daily lives. Now some of us, more than others, some less than others, have gone online to do various things on the internet, and you ever see something that catches your eye? At least it calls it clickbait. I think it's a good way to think about it because it's something that's eye-catching. You can click on it and you realize that's really not even worth reading or looking at. It's not even true. They have some kind of catching headline and that's how they draw you in. In many ways, that's how the world is today as well. There's many things that can draw us in and when we get involved, we realize this is something we really don't want to be a part of. And so we become distracted. Notice what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3. And looking at verses 18 and 19, we know when we get distracted, we can become disobedient. The Bible says, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter uh, his rest, but to those who did not obey? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Now the rest he's talking about here is the rest of eternal life. And he says that many could not enter in because of their unbelief. 
People today get distracted because of various different reasons, various things. Some, no doubt, understandable because the temptation to get distracted is very strong. Others are lured away, we might say, for a lot less. You wonder how could that distract you and cause you to lose your faith? How could you allow that to happen? But it does happen. And so we have to realize we cannot allow ourselves to become distracted, no matter what it may be that can distract us. Different things will distract different people. What may distract me may not interest you in the least. And what may distract you, I may have never even heard of before. And so what may distract one person may not distract another. But as we see here, if we do become distracted and spend our time in things that we need to maybe a lot a certain amount of time for. Maybe it doesn't we need to realize it's not on the top of our priority list. If we do not do that, then we can become disobedient and allow disobedience to creep into our lives. Still, some get distracted because they are living after the flesh. That is, they're looking at this world and see what this world has to offer, and they want to buy into it and do all they can to enjoy the fleshly pleasures of this life. Notice Romans chapter 8 in verse 13. He says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if it's by the Spirit you, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. We think about what he's talking about. He says, if you live according to the flesh, that is, according to the things we see in this world, if we mold ourselves after what this world says we need to be doing and living and how uh, we need to live and what should be interesting to, to us, those types of things, he says, quite plainly, you will die. But if by the Spirit, that is, if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. If we live according to the Word of God, if we mold our lives around what God says we need to put first and not mold what God says around our lives, then we become, then we allow to ourselves to put God first. Think about this for a moment. You ever been flipping through the television and there's some commercial on for a television show and they play a little clip and you hear the audience laughing and you think, what was so funny about that? Meantime, just a crude little line like we saw this afternoon while watching a game. A crude line about someone in their dating life. And the audience supposedly laugh. What people don't realize many times is that what you hear is not actually a live audience. You actually hear what they call a laugh tape, which is recordings of people laughing. And so they'll slide that in there when they put in a line and want you to you hear that laughter. And they're like, oh, that's supposed to be funny. And so we have to realize that what the world says is entertaining is not always entertaining. In fact, many times it's outright sinful, and we need to stay away from it. But we think about what's on television, we think about what's on the radio, which is one of the reasons why we do our radio broadcasts, because there's so much other stuff out there that's terrible, we want to be something that's good. And so for that reason, we are able to reach others who don't want to hear that other garbage that's out there. Because we are encouraging others to live by the Spirit, to live in a way that's pleasing to God, and not live according to the flesh. Because as Paul points out, if you do so, you will die if you live after the world. Well, what are some other reasons? We're going to have some more general reasons now. What are some other reasons that people fall away? Well, some never develop enough to what I call fly solo. There are some today, and I, I haven't been to that many places and, and preached that many different locations on a full-time basis or anything like that, but it never fails. There's always at least one person, sometimes more, who what I call is not really a babe in Christ because they've been a Christian long enough, they should know better, but they're one of those I say you have to hold their hand. If you don't talk to them every week, there's no guarantee they'll come to services. Because it's almost as if you had to tell them you need to be there. As a Christian, should we have to be told you need to be there? No. As a Christian, we should realize, I want, I want to be there. And so there are some who never develop enough to fly solo. You have to guide them throughout everything they do that comes, comes into their life. They maybe they don't pray very much or maybe don't pray at all. Maybe they don't realize the necessity of coming to services, not because the preacher wants you to be there, but because God wants them to be there. 
They don't realize the necessity of living a faithful life and resisting temptation and sin and on and on and on. And because of that, they're never really able to fly solo. You know, different animals in the, animals in the animal kingdom, some stay with their mother for a period of time, some leave their mother almost immediately. And what you'll notice on some of these nature shows is that many will, will die, but some will figure out very quickly what they need to do and they'll survive and they're able to maintain and live on their own without their mother's protection. And so as a Christian, we want to realize that we have to be willing to develop enough that we can live the Christian life without someone guiding us on how to do it. But we know there is always someone who's supposed to guide us, and we, He does guide us when we allow Him to do so through His Word. Notice Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, when He says, Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth, meaning while you're young, before the difficult days come, and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. I get kind of tickled at some of the young men who I play basketball with and talk about difficult things they're facing, and I tell them, I'm not even that much older than you, but you haven't seen anything yet. Just wait till you get older. Wait till you get children and multiple children. Maybe wait till you uh, have a child growing up who's getting married and goes off. You're going to face a lot more than what's coming your way now. And so we notice here in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 1, he says, Before the difficult days come. That is why it's so important we teach our children what they need to do to be pleasing to God because when difficult days come, they're not going to be able to fly on their own. They're going to depart from the faith if they ever came to the faith and go away doubting, perhaps, what they need to be doing. And so we need to do all we can to instruct our children and children and teenagers can do all they can to learn all they can about God and the Bible because the difficult days are going to come. Life does not get simpler. It gets more complicated. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11 says, How can a young man cleanse his way? Now, we know the text says, How can a young man? But this applies to everyone, no matter their, their age, doesn't it? Young, old, male, female, it doesn't matter. He says, By taking heed according to, to your, that is God, to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. How can we guide our children so they can fly on their own as they get older? How can we prepare ourselves to no longer need someone to call us every Sunday morning saying, Are you awake? We need to prepare ourselves and decide that God comes first and we make those decisions on our own as an obedient follower of Christ. Here's another problem we run into sometimes. That is that some will never be truly converted. Some have been taught the gospel. Some have heard and obeyed, were even baptized. But they themselves, despite sound teaching and the effort of those who they studied with, were never truly converted. They know what the Bible says about obedience, but they have never decided that they're going to actually be obedient. There's a lesson that I have prepared when I do Bible studies, and it's before I do one on salvation, and it's involving the idea of counting the cost. It is you know what God expects of you before you're ever baptized. Because too many people are learning what they, God expects from them after baptism. They're saying, look, you know what, never mind. That's not the way to do it. And so we have to realize some are never truly converted. Despite the best efforts of those who have taught with them, taught them and studied with them, they're never truly converted. Notice Matthew 13, verse 20 and 21. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they, he stumbles. Now, when we see the word tribulation or persecution, we're thinking we're being thrown in jail, we're being you know, beaten. Sometimes it's simple as someone mocking you and you saying, you know what, I'm not going back there. A family member says something, a friend says something, a boss says something. You decide, I'm not going back there anymore. 
It's not worth it. It's not worth coming back and hearing my friend make a little comment or hear my family member say something. That's why some are never truly converted because they never are truly convicted to obey the gospel and to really be obedient. Notice he says here in verse 20, he says, he hears the word, immediately receives it with joy. He hears it and he obeys it. But notice verse 21, yet he has no root in himself. He has no what? Strong desire to be faithful, but endures only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution, when hard times come, he says, because of the word, they immediately stumble. And so we have to realize the reason some fall away is because they were never truly converted. They never really had the conviction to be faithful to God. Let's ask another, ask another question. Who are the fallen? Who are those who are falling away? Sometimes we have confusion over people who are falling away. Some say, well, you know, they haven't been here in a while. That's one way. Some say, well, you know, they have a different idea on this, and so they don't come to the church of Christ and when they go to some denomination, there's another one. And we can list on and on, how do we know someone who has fallen away? Who, is, who would fall into the category of those who have fallen away? Well, let's look at Galatians chapter 6 and verse 1. He says, Brethren, if any man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. He's saying here, if anyone is what? Overtaking in sin, living in sin, he says what? He says, you who are spiritual, which means there's some who aren't. You who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of meekness. Now, restore such a one means it sounds like you'll be able to restore them. No problem. Well, that's not the case, is it? Some, all it takes is talking with them and reading some scriptures, asking them what that scripture means, and they realize, you know what, I'm in sin, I need to turn around and do what is right. But that's not always the case. He says here in verse 1, Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves, lest you also be tempted. He's saying you go and you try to restore that person, but also you notice what he says. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted, saying, you be careful lest they pull you also into that same sin. We must realize those who are fallen are those who are overtaken in sin, those who are living in sin. We also see that those who are fallen are those who are walking disorderly, that is, those who willfully sin and refuse to repent. Look at 2 Thessalonians 3 and verse 6. But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you receive from us. He's saying that those who are walking disorderly, which means what? It means there's an order in which a Christian is to walk, but they're not doing it. They're not walking in the orderly fashion that is obedience in which the Christian is to walk in. He says that you would draw from every brother who walks disorderly. Why is that? Because if we're constantly around those who are walking disorderly and in sin, they will influence you possibly to the point of even pulling you away into sin. Do you remember when Paul uh, stood up and rebuked Peter to his face? One of the things he mentions is that even Barnabas was carried away with Peter and his hypocrisy. Sin can influence others to sin. And so we are to withdraw ourselves from them because, as he says here in verse uh, 6, withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the, to the tradition which he received from us. That tradition, being inspired of God, will be the words of Christ, the teachings of Christ. Those who will not adhere to it will not do what is right. He says we are to withdraw ourselves from them. Notice also Hebrews 10 and verse 26. He says, For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there is no longer remains a sacrifice for us. There are those who know what sin is, know exactly what the Bible says about it, and they just flat out do not care. They know what the Bible says about alcohol. They know what the Bible says about tobacco. They know what the Bible says about dancing and all these other types of things. They just flat out do not care. What do we do? If they will not change, we don't spend our time with them. Why would you spend time with someone who just says, I don't care what the Bible says on that. 
That's not who the Christian is to be in fellowship with. Those who are fallen are those who have forsaken Christ for this world. That's what it really boils down to. Notice 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Paul says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. That can include a whole host of things. But Paul just simply says he loves this world. He says, and has a part for Thessalonica, Christians for Galatia, and Titus for Dalmatia. And so Demas had forsaken him. That is, he left Paul. If he had forsaken him, obviously he's talking about the idea that he is no longer doing that which is right. Because he loves this present world. Who else are those who are fallen? Those who are in apostasy, as we say sometimes. Those who are causing division. Those who stand for error, uh, and those who stand, must say, with error, and will not stand for truth, are those who are not following Christ. Romans 16, verse 17 says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses. Now, we mentioned this before. Who is guilty of causing division and offenses? Those who stand for truth? No. And that's how it's really labeled many times. Well, you're just being divisive. Well, you're the one holding false teaching. Look at verse 17. He says, Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. Avoid them, meaning what? If they're not going to do what is right and stand for what is right, if they're going to embrace error and not defend truth, then we are not to be with them. As one preacher said when I was at a uh, lectureship this past year in, in September, he said, you cannot preach, for tr preach the truth without standing against error. Meaning, you, if you're going to preach the truth, you cannot embrace error as well. You have to preach, preach the truth and stand for the truth, and at the same time, stand against error. How does God, as we close this evening, how does God see the condition of the erring? How does God look upon them? You know, it's hard to think about sometimes God's viewpoint, and no doubt we have a very small idea of what that may be. But we also know that God sees the condition of the erring. We know that He sees those who are in error, those who are falling away, or those who are not in fellowship with Him. 1 John 1, beginning in verse 7, says, But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ His Son cleanses us from all sin. That is who is, who is in fellowship with God. He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Who are those who are not in fellowship with God? Those in verse 8, as He says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If the truth is not in us, we cannot be in fellowship with God. How does God see the condition of the erring? We seize that person as a lost soul. Matthew 16, verse 26, he says, For what profit is to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? That tells us that man can indeed lose their soul. And he uses the idea here in verse 26 as one who is trying to gain the things of this world. And he says, what is it? You know, what is the profit of man? What good does it do you if you gain everything, but you are unfaithful? You lose your own soul. He also says, or sees them as those who have returned to their own vomit, their own mud, and in sin in general. 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20, says, For after they have escaped the pollutions of the world, through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are entangled again in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. He's talking about those who have heard the gospel, obeyed it, but now they're going back into the world. He says in verse 21 and 22, For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. But it has happened to them, according to the true proverb, a dog returns his own vomit, and a sow having washed her wallowing in the mire. He's saying they have gone back into sin. Why do some fall? There are reasons after reasons, but none of them are good ones. The reasons people today remain faithful is because they realize in order to have heaven as their home, they cannot be disobedient in the sight of God. 
We have to be willing to have others mock us, dislike us, say things about us, and on and on. While at the same time remaining faithful to God. Because we know whenever you remain faithful to God, not everybody is going to like you. And if everybody likes you, there's a good chance you're probably not very pleasing to God. And so let's remember as we think about these things this evening that we have seen just a few of some of the ways people have fallen away. Well, let's make sure that we are not involved in any of those things that would cause us to fall away. This evening, as you think about these things, if we can help you or assist you anyway, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <laughs>